to the example that comes up next. So earlier in lecture, uh, we talked about really, uh, you know, three different types of titrations. Um, again, we did our strong acid, strong base titration, uh, which really did have sort of four distinct uh, points on it. Um, again, before you start the titration, before the equivalence point, at the equivalence point, and then obviously after the equivalence point. Um, we saw the typical kind of S curve uh, that basically happens with when we do a titration curve, especially starting with an acid and titrating a base into it. Um, so we talked about how to calculate the sort of pH along the way there. We also talked about our weak acid and strong base titration. Again, sort of your typical S curve coming up because uh, we're adding base, so the pH gets higher and the four distinct parts there as well. Again, as we saw, very different in terms of calculations. The good news is, as we talked about that, uh, you know, it's all really calculations we've previously talked about. And the key though is, like I mentioned, understanding sort of where you are in those titration curves and what type of problem you should be doing. So really important. Sometimes people don't really think it's that important to understand sort of where you are, but tremendously important in terms of, of the calculation. And then we finished up talking about the last type, which is a little bit different of a titration. And that was a strong acid and weak base. The base is actually what we're starting with. So we see our titration curve actually start high and then drop down. Um, in terms of the pH because we're adding acid to it. Uh, really that titration and the one in the middle, the weak acid strong base titration, they are virtually the same in terms of the calculations at each of those parts. The only difference is, as I mentioned, they're going from the weak acid, adding the strong base, we go from more acidic solution to a basic solution at the end and vice versa, obviously starting with our base and adding their acid we're starting high on the pH and ending low, but really the same four parts on each of those curves are identical to each other in terms of the types of calculations that she has to do. But understanding sort of what's happening there, you'll understand, you know, to make sure that, you know, for example, on the last one, if you're in that buffer region, you probably in most cases, I won't say 100% of the time, but most cases, you'll probably end up with more of a basic buffer while if you're doing the weak acid strong base, you'll end up with an acidic buffer. So, you know, really understanding sort of what you should be expecting in these calculations are really important. Also important when we do sort of a, a traditional titration, uh, maybe not so much. And honestly, we don't a lot of times use them. Um, if you're doing a titration curve, we oftentimes will use a pH meter like we saw in the buffer videos. Um, but uh, if we're doing sort of a regular titration, where we want to stop at the equivalence point, obviously acid base indicators are really important sort of tools to help us decide when we should sort of stop the titration and when the titration is over. So what is sort of an indicator? Well, really an indicator is, is sort of like a weak acid and it has a protonated form just like a weak acid and it has a form where it's lost its H plus just like a weak acid would. So Indicators are almost like weak acids. And depending on sort of the ratio of the protonated form to the non-protonated form there will be sort of the color that we would sort of see. Now, each of these has sort of a distinct color in acidic solutions and a distinct color in basic sort of solution or the basic side. But indicators for their cells, as we talked about earlier, I think, they basically work over a pH range. And, you know, at a certain pH range, it's a certain color. And then, you know, as the pH sort of changes, it goes to a different color towards this end. And that's really part of what makes really indicators work well, is that we can kind of see the change in color. And that's a really important aspect of it is being able to actually see that color change because when we see that color change, that's like a signal to us that, oh, we should stop perhaps, yeah? We should stop this titration. So, you know, you definitely wanna make sure that you stop the titration when you see that color change. And when should we be looking for that color change? Well, usually when you do a titration, it is that equivalence point, that's the big point. And that's usually when we wanna stop a normal titration, uh, when we are just sort of interested in reaching sort of the equivalence point. And that's when our moles of our acid and base equal each other. So 
when we're picking an actual indicator to do that, we want one that definitely changes color over a pH range close to the equivalence point. So we can see here on this chart, for example, crystal violet works over like a pH range of just roughly zero to one point something. And one point something here, it is more blue, obviously closer to zero there, it's a yellow color. So this would be a great choice if you know we had uh, something that had an equivalence point somewhere in this range in terms of pH, we'd be able to see that color change basically occur. Um, all these obviously work over different color ranges. You can see some of these work great in sort of the acidic range, some towards the neutral range and some in the basic range. Here's everybody's favorite right there, phenyl phthalene. And it should be that uh, pinky guy right here. And again, as you can see, phenyl phthalene really works around pH of like 8.3 to like a pH of 10. And you can see it's kind of pinky here and really light pink in this region. And that's why when you've used phenolphthalein maybe in the past for titrations, they tell you stop at that first light pink. And that's because you probably have used phenolphthalein in titrations where the equivalence point is basic. And by you stopping, so for example, if this is like 8.3, this is like 10. And again, this is really colorless on this side. And then we get kind of that really light, light, light pink this way. And then super, super, super dark pink this way. I know it's red, imagine it's pink. And um, when they tell you to stop at that very first, the kind of light pink that stays, that would put you probably, you know, you know over here in this region, which is probably pretty close to the equivalence point. If you shoot it to that dark pink, you might be in that pH of 10. And why would that be important? Well, if you think about sort of that titration curve we saw, that's the equivalence point, right? Say that's a pH of like 8.7. You know, if you got a little careless in sort of adding your base and you jumped all the way to here, it could potentially put you like over here, could potentially put you over here, could potentially put you over here, which is significantly far away in terms of volume of what you added, which means if you know, if you sort of ended up over here, this is like the equivalence point and you definitely overshot it a lot. But now, as we were also talking about during lecture earlier, you know, if you're really careful though, and you're getting close to the equivalence point, and you're like doing drop by drop by drop, you could actually still see that giant change in terms of color. But if you're doing it drop by drop, you might actually just find yourself like there, which in grand scheme of things, not all that bad because you're probably still very close to the equivalence point. So they usually yell at you to go the very lightest pink because you know maybe you haven't done a lot of titrations or you're not very proficient in titrations and they probably figure most people want to see a color change and not very good on patience. So they open up their burette and just let it drain in, right? Which means if you do that and you're really not careful, you're gonna jump to a pretty dark color and you're probably gonna jump pretty far past the equivalence point in terms of volume. And that difference in color would make a very big difference in your calculation versus you may actually see the same color here, but the difference in terms of where the equivalence point should be and where you stopped is not that big of a deal. So if you do titrations in the future or have done titrations and you're very sort of cautious as you're doing titrations and you add it sort of drop by drop as you get close to the equivalence point. And even if you got that famous saying, like I said, one drop and it went super dark pink, you know, even if you miss it by one drop, you're probably okay for calculation wise because you're probably all not very far away from where the true equivalence point uh, would be. Again, though, if you really were not very cautious while you're doing it and you just open it up and let it flow, you probably jump pretty far past your equivalence point. Any questions on that there? Now, what happens? I decide, well, everybody uses phenolphthalein. Why should I be like everybody else? I shouldn't use phenolphthalein for that titration. I want to use, you know, let's go with this guy. That seems like a cool name. That's bromo 
Phenol Blue. That's a mouthful there. And it's got this kind of cool color code, right? Can I just, you know, grab that guy and use it? Well, this guy works roughly three to, if we went down, maybe five is four and change, three is a pH of four and some change. Um, which means if you're doing a titration where your equivalence points over here, by the time it gets to four and change, it's gonna be that pretty blue color or purple color and pretty much not gonna change, right? So at that point, once you get to your pH of 8.7, where you want your guy to change color and stop, you're gonna have like no way to know when you're there, right? Because it's pretty much just gonna kind of stay that color all the way through. So that's why it would be probably a pretty crappy choice, right? To choose that one, because you won't be able to visually see the color change. So that's why you wanna always choose an indicator where you can actually see the color change to indicate to you to stop the titration. And clearly you wanna pick something where the color change occurs near the perceived equivalence point. And you can figure that out by kind of knowing the type of titration you're doing. You can also figure it out by doing a theoretical calculation of what the pH should be at the equivalence point if you're not sure and you could actually choose one where that would actually be appropriate for your titration. Question on that there. All right, so here, why don't you take a second and think about it here. Here's a list of some indicators there on the bottom and the pH range for which they work and the colors that we see and uh, which indicator or indicators would be a good choice for a titration of HNO2, nitrous acid with potassium hydroxide. So take a minute and think about how we probably should approach this. Well, this again does come back to sort of what we talked about earlier that, you know, we want to sort of understand, you know, what type of titration we're doing. And that does give us a lot of information about you know, what should be happening in that titration. So the first thing you might wanna look at is the two things here in the titration. I got HNO2. HNO2 is not nitric acid, it is nitrous acid. And nitric acid is a strong acid. Nitrous acid is actually a weak acid. I got KOH. KOH is a strong base. So again, here we would be having our KOH up in the burette. We would have our nitrous acid down there in the burette. So this is titration of a weak acid plus a strong base. So from our conversations earlier today, you should have a very good understanding that when you look at this titration curve, where we have our equivalence point in this case, should actually be basic. And you know that from our conversation because when this is said and done and we reach the equivalence point, we pretty much will only have a salt left, which is KNO2, potassium nitrite. And that breaks apart into K plus and NO2 minus. And this is not important, but this is a salt that came from a weak acid which means it will actually go through hydrolysis like we talked about. Again, why it's important to understand what is happening when we do these things. And because it came from a weak acid, it will act as a base. And when it does, it will make the nitrous acid. And more importantly, why we know it will be basic is it will produce hydroxide. So this is, again, why this chapter is super important to conceptually understand what is going on so you can answer these type of questions and, and really kind of know what is going on. First off, any questions on what I just did there? All right. So now, how does that sort of relate to choices for my indicator? Well, We'll start with the first one here. That's thymol blue. That's changing color from red to yellow in this acidic range. Probably not a great choice because my pH should be basic, which means it's got to be above seven. So that's not going to allow me to visually see anything happen. Neither is this guy, which also is more acidic. 
this guy it will not work either this guy will not work either because that's 6.3 that's less than seven that's not basic this will not work either again you're maxing out in terms of c in the color change at 6.4 not gonna work very well this one right here at 7.6 my guess is probably not going to work very well. Remember, seven is neutral. So that only gives you like 0.6 of a pH to actually see. And probably by that point at 7.6, the color is probably already changed, right? Because it started at six. So the color is changing at six to about 7.6, which means you probably won't be able to see any type of color change near the equivalence point. So probably not the best. Creosol red, that is definitely basic. So that is a possibility. And our phenolphthalein here, definitely basic. So that is a possibility. So out of this table here, these two here are potentially possible good indicators to use in this titration. Clearly we would not want to use, like I said, uh, anybody above there because they're really more acidic. First off, any questions on that? And like I said before, if you want to truly dial in on which one would be most appropriate, you could actually do a calculation based on what you're starting with and, and calculate what the theoretical pH should be at the equivalence point. And you could maybe choose between the two. What would the top ones be good at in terms of uh, indicators? Well, some of the other ones in the acidic range, you know, maybe some of these guys here might be good for a titration like our HCl with NH3. That again would be like our weak base strong acid. And as we talked about, when we have that titration at the equivalence point, should be acidic, which means obviously these two would not be so great for that, but maybe some of these guys in this area here might work really well for that. So. You know, there is a lot more to it. Sometimes people think I've only heard of phenolphthalein. I've only used phenolphthalein in, in classes. That's like the only indicator that there is in the world. And I should always use it for every situation. And it's really not. So, you know, you know, it depends on the type of titration you're doing. Truth be told, if you did a strong acid, strong base, the pH at the equivalence point should be seven for that type of titration which means I know people do use phenolphthalein for that, but really, you know, you're kind of past that equivalence point or maybe it, as well in terms of the pH range. It still works, you know, if you go very, very slow and you really do stop at like the first shine of pink, it'll be okay. But really backing it up to something like this might be a better choice for a titration like that. Again, you got that six to 7.6 range and might allow you to maybe focus in on it or maybe even creosol red as well might be a, a better choice for that as well. So, you know, the type of titration that you use and what you expect to happen at the equivalence point would dictate obviously the correct choice of an indicator. Any questions on indicators or how it works and all that kind of stuff? Okay. So uh, what we will do now is, um, we have pretty much only one thing left here and it's an example. And uh, let me do, actually, actually, let me do this. Can I, let's go that way. Actually, we're here. So, we so we have this example uh, that should be coming up next. This is a titration of nitrous acid with sodium hydroxide. Uh, the Ka value is given to you. We want to calculate the pH at four different parts and the initial solution before any, any sodium hydroxide is added. After 80 milliliters of the sodium hydroxide is added at the equivalence point and when 105 milliliters of the base has been added. So what I'd like you to do is maybe for next... Uh, 25 minutes or so, we'll start working on these. I'll open up some breakout rooms. You wanna kind of work on it together and then we'll come back
and we'll start going through it to make sure everybody's on sort of the right page. All right, when we do these, what do we got going on? So we have HNO2, I see again a KA here. So kind of like that uh, indicator sort of situation. This is a weak acid and sodium hydroxide is a strong base. So again, here we have a titration of a weak acid plus a strong base. And we know that in general, it should have that sort of S curve happening. And we're going to kind of look at all these points here in terms of the pH. We also should kind of off the top of the bat here, like we talked about, know the equivalence point should be a little basic there at this point and we'll get there. But we'll start with A. So again, in a case, just to make sure everybody's on the same page, uh, up in the burette is our sodium hydroxide in this case. And then obviously we are adding it to the nitrous acid. So at part A, the initial solution before we add any of the uh, sodium hydroxide here, as we can see, we basically just have the HNO2 in the flask or the beaker. And that means that basically what we have going there is just a weak acid. So by knowing sort of this titration, we know that this really should be like a Ka type problem and the weak acid problem. And that's really where we'll start. So uh, we'll start with our HNO2, just gonna approach it as a Ka problem because it's just a weak acid, break apart into H plus and NO2 minus. Ka value given to us, uh, 4.5 to the minus four in that case. So because we have not added any sodium hydroxide at this point, we could do everything in molarity. The molarity of the nitrous acid has not changed. So we can do it here in molarity. Again, since we haven't added anything, we're going to do zeros. Changes here will be X's. So minus X plus X plus X. That means at equilibrium here, 0 0.1 minus X x and x any questions on the ice table there so far okay uh so again this is a ka problem we would go into our ka expression which would be our products over our reactants there that means we basically have x squared divided by 0.1 minus x equaling our 4.5 times 10 to the minus four. It is a small value of k, so you can try to assume that x is equal to zero. And if you do that, I would hope like we've talked about before that you did check it, you would end it up with an x value of 0 0.006708 which if we would have divided by 0.1 and times it by 100, would have gave us about 6.7%, which is not so good here based on our 5% rule. So again, a reminder that, you know, the assumption will not always work, will not be correct. You do want to still make sure that you do check it. Again, not going to make a tremendous difference here in the pH at the end all of a lot in this particular example, but technically it is wrong if you did the assumption here and didn't check it. So because our assumption is no good, uh, we need to kind of go back and solve it uh, using the quadratic. So that would give us x squared multiplying the bottom to the other side there, and that would get us uh, 0.1 times 4.5 to the minus 4. So give us some zeros here, one, two, three, four, and then minus 4.5 times 10 to the minus four X, bringing everybody to one side gets us X squared plus 4.5 times 10 to the minus four X. That then turns that into a minus zero, 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 four, five equaling zero. That gives us X is equal to uh, <laughs> uh, minus B, I think, plus or minus the square root 0.0004.
B squared minus 4AC. See, I forgot the quadratic there for a second. I think that looks right. So uh, popping our numbers in there, that's going to give us uh, a minus 4.5 times 10 to the minus 4, plus or minus. If we do inside the square root, I think inside the square root there, we will get uh, 4 times minus 0.00. I believe we will get something like uh, 0 0.0001802 inside the square root. And then if we take the square root of it, looks like we will get something like 0 0.0134. It's going to all be divided by 2 times 1, which would be 2. That's going to give us an x value here going the positive root there, the plus minus uh, 4.5 to the minus 4 plus 0 0.0134 divided by 2 gives us a 0 0.006475 going the subtraction root, which right off the bat I know is no good, but uh, we will end up with a negative 0 0.006925. Again, we really know that that one's no good because we cannot have a negative concentration. And obviously in this case, our H plus equals X. So definitely this cannot be it. Any questions on that so far? That means that obviously the positive guy there should be the right one. That also means that that would equal the H plus concentration. And that means that the pH would equal minus the log of 0 0.006475. And looks like perhaps a 2.19 on our opening pH here in our titration of our weak acid. Any questions on that part A? So really, again, part A is, you know, pretty much a standard weak acid problem, um, just like we've done before. And that's the only thing sitting in that solution at that point. Any questions on that? Okay. Then let's take a look at uh, part B and see what's happening. So in part B, we are adding um, 80 milliliters of our base, which has a molarity of 0 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide uh, to our acid, which we started with 100 milliliters of 0 0.1 molar nitrous acid. So clearly we're adding our base here. So we're going to get a reaction. So that's gonna be our HNO2 plus our sodium hydroxide. Gonna get us some um, sodium nitrite and some water here. Clearly we are starting the titration here, which means we're definitely changing the volume. So as we talked about a number of times at this point, we wanna do this in moles. So to figure out the moles of the HNO2, we're gonna go 0.1, which is 100 milliliters converted to liters times 0.1. And you get an error because I hit the wrong button there. But 0.1 times 0.1 gives us 0 0.1 moles. We'll do the same thing for sodium hydroxide. That's 0 0.08 converting that to liters times 0.1 which is uh, 0 0.008 moles. This is gonna be zero, this is gonna be zero. Again, this is the part where you wanna kind of recognize sort of where you're at, what's going on. Just a reminder, you could use your ice table to do that. We started with this guy, we're adding this guy. And again, when we compare the moles of the base, to moles of the acid, which we're starting with. In this particular case, the moles of the acid wins. And that tells us for sure we are actually before the equivalence point, which also should give you a pretty good hint 
as to what type of problem you should be doing. And you should end up with, as we talked about, really a buffer. And again, you should know these things before you actually do the calculation, you know, so you don't hopefully screw up the calculation. Any questions on that reasoning there? Change would obviously then be our limiting, which is the sodium hydroxide in this case. So that's going to be minus 0 0.008 moles. That's going to be minus 0 0.008 moles. It's going to be plus 0 0.008 moles. That is then going to get us to equilibrium, where we would have 0 0.01 minus 0 0.008, uh, 0 0.002 moles. This guy will zero out, we'll end up with 0 0.008 moles. And as we talked about earlier, we definitely want at this point to convert back to molarity. To convert back to molarity, we need to think about our total volume. And that is going to be 80 milliliters plus 100 milliliters without the use of a calculator. I'm gonna go with 180 milliliters and hope for the best there. And we're gonna then divide each of these by 0.18 liters to get us into molarity. And that would get us 0 0.002 divided by a 0.18. It's a lot of ones there. That is 0 0.0111. I'll stop at that point, 0 0.008 divided by 0 0.180. It's a lot of fours, 0 0.0444 at this point. Any questions on the ice table, how we got the total volume or anything like that? All right, so let's just say, well, you know, you were sleeping there in that part and you didn't remember this whole situation we were talking about. And maybe you're out here going, hmm, not sure what I should do. Again, your ice table could really be very helpful for you. We could look again and see what we got left over, which is HNO2 and NaNO2. That again, we know is a weak acid and that feels a lot like his conjugate base or the salt of it. And if you forgot about that initial idea there, this can remind you hopefully that that is going to be a buffer at this point. So again, you know, even if up front, you know, you maybe didn't recognize the relationship that should occur here, um, you can again, look at your ice table to help you figure that sort of relationship out as well. Any questions on that there? All right, so uh, you, you have that conversation. Now you go, cool, I know it's a buffer. Or you go, cool, I know it was supposed to be a buffer. You know, I'm happy, all that good stuff here. You have two choices, obviously, to get the pH at this point, like we've talked about before. You could definitely use the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, which might present less room for error because it is a buffer. Or you could do an additional ice table. I'm gonna choose the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation at this point, and that's gonna get us a pKa plus the log of the base over the acid. We do need to get a little pKa action here. So that's gonna be the minus the log of the Ka. That's gonna be minus the log, what was that thing? 4.5 times 10 to the minus four. That's gonna get us, uh, you know, an answer. There's a lot of numbers there, all that good stuff. Uh, we'll go 335 on that pKa value. That means our pH would be 335 plus the log of the base. And again, uh, just by the name of it, right, that is obviously nitrous acid and the Ka value, which means this guy here has got to be my base. And that means that this guy should go up on top, 0 0.0444 divided by 0 0.0111. And if we do that, looks like we end up with a 3.95 as our pH at this point. Any questions on that there? And again, to remind you that if you chose the ice table approach over 
the Henderson Hasselbach. This is what it would look like. Uh, you would have uh, over here 0 0.0111, 0, 0, 0, 0, oops, 444. We would use X's. I think I squeeze the zero in there. And obviously that would go into your Ka. You would solve for X. And then you would go into your pH because that would obviously be your H plus, which should end you here as well. So again, you do have a couple of different ways you could do that, but uh, either way should get you to the right spot. Any questions on this part of the titration? Does our number sort of make sense based off of our original number? Well, our original number was like a, a pH, we'll call it two, we'll call that three, we'll call that four. So our, our original pH was, you know, somewhere over here. And then at this point, we're at 335, which is, you know, making sense as we are adding, obviously, base to it so we do see it go up so you know it does make sense clearly at this point if you've got a ph less than 2.19 you're definitely going in the wrong direction any questions on that there on the henderson equation if we yeah. were to use moles it would not make a difference right it would not make a difference so that's the one place technically speaking uh if you went into the henderson hasselbach um you could actually do it in moles because uh when you do the volume here and here, they basically cancel each other out and it works out the exact same. Um, I would again recommend always though, converting it back to molarity because you will run into trouble if you don't really kind of do things correctly when you get to maybe something where you have to do a hydrolysis uh, reaction next, you need the molarity and you know, so everything other than maybe a buffer, you kind of need molarity to do it correctly. Even if you kind of want the ice table approach, so it's always probably pretty good practice to convert it back to molarity after that first ice table, um, but you are correct. It really will not technically make a difference here if you went in with moles on both of those. Okay, and then so for the ice table version, instead of the equation, um, we result in a buffer, but we just, uh, I see we solve for how much uh, hydronium or H plus the yeah, acid is giving. Okay. Yeah, so this basically is kind of like what we talked about with the common ion approach at the very beginning before we really got to the Henderson Hasselbach equation. Mm -hmm. And what kind of makes it a buffer again is a reminder you do need this initial here. Otherwise, not the buffer. And if you don't put this initial number here, then you're really just doing a weak acid problem like we did in part A and you won't get the right answer. So that's why I say, you know, if you can recognize the buffer, probably much better to kind of go into here less room for error. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people like put a big old zero there to start with and there's a buffer. And again, you'll get the wrong answer. So that's a super common mistake. But if you don't make that mistake and you do it correctly, it's perfectly fine to do it that way as well. So, um, but it is a very, very common mistake that kind of part there uh, when people don't put a, um, a concentration there initially. Right, Other, okay. Okay, other questions on anything? 